I find that a lot of my friends who are believers are afraid to think about life in the universe because they're so confident of God creating them and giving them life. They don't know quite how to deal with the idea that maybe God gave life elsewhere to other creatures, bacteria or even intelligent creatures somewhere else. The problem is not in the science, is there life possible elsewhere, or even in the theology of could God create life elsewhere, but what does that mean to me? A biologist might say that life is wonderfully complicated chemistry, and it certainly is, but that might be just like saying that the Mona Lisa is wonderfully complicated pieces of paint, which it certainly is, but there's more to it than that. Life includes not only the chemistry, but you and I recognizing the chemistry and interacting with the chemistry. And only by finding life elsewhere in the universe will we really be able to fully understand what it means to be alive, just as a baby finally encountering another baby has a better idea of what it means to be an individual among other individuals. It's going to be a very exciting discovery. Well, how can we make that discovery? First of all, we have to know that there are other planets, starting with understanding what planets are in our solar system that goes back to Galileo and his telescope. We recognize the possibility there could be life on other planets. We haven't found it yet. We're looking for water and chemical traces on Mars that indicate maybe there could be life under the surface of Mars. We look for similar things in maybe the oceans under the ice crust of Europa or the oceans under the ice crust of Enceladus, a, a moon of Saturn, or any of the other places where life could exist. In the last 20 years, we've discovered planets, thousands of planets around other stars. And now we're beginning to look for ways where we might be able to find life there. What characteristics of an atmosphere would tell you that there was life? What you're really looking for is the changes that life produces, as you say, in the atmosphere of a planet. At the beginning, it doesn't have oxygen. Oxygen, or very little oxygen, is something peculiar that life produces, at least life that we know it, uh, that relies on carbon and the wonderful complexity that carbon can produce. So it's signatures of oxygen in the um, planet. Have we found signatures of oxygen in any of these planets? Not yet. <laughs> Let's keep what, if, what about water? Yes, we, we've found water, and so that, that's, that's a good... Uh, it's a good first step. That's a good first step, yes, because uh, life as we know it just needs water. It needs liquid water, really. Have we found chlorophyll? <laughs> that would, no, not yet, uh, only in our imagination, let's say. But that would be the sort of thing we would hope to be able to find. Yes, exactly. So there would be a chance, you know, in the next 20 or 30 or 50 years of finding planets that might have water, that might have oxygen, that might even have chlorophyll in the spectrum of the atmosphere. That's a real dream, but who knows? Scientists have to dream and then suddenly bit by bit the dream becomes possible. So we find these planets, which we've done, we found thousands of them now. We find a way of measuring their atmosphere. What happens theologically when we discover that there is life on another planet? I don't even mean little green men, just chlorophyll, just plant life. Does that shake our understanding of our place in the universe? Would it shake your understanding of our place in the universe, our relationship to God? It, it wouldn't, um, because in a sense the shaking has been happening, you know, throughout uh, you know our human history, and certainly throughout late history. The scenario at the beginning was that uh, you know, for our, us humans, we were the center. Our Earth was the center of everything. You know, everything else moves. Look up in the sky, the, even the sun moves across the sky. We must be in the center. I don't feel I'm moving. You don't feel you're moving. We're at the center. And then gradually the revolution started. 
what's called the Copernican Revolution and our understanding that, no, it's actually the sun that's the stationary one in our planetary system and the planets move around it. And similarly, in our nearby stars, we're all moving in relation to each other. We're actually moving around the center of our galaxy. It takes uh, a quarter of a billion years. It's pretty slow, but uh, actually we're going pretty fast to come to think well, of it to get around. All of this just make us feel smaller and more insignificant and destroy the thought that God just made me and just made you? Well, I think it can only do so if we have the wrong idea of God. The problem is we never make God big enough. And that's true of you know, us, it's true of people who think, who professionally think about God. Some theologians don't make God big enough. God is big enough to make everything important. We're not. We have to, I pay attention to you now, I can't pay attention to other people. We're limited. God's not. God can make everything in the universe important. And that's what God does. Because God made it and God found everything good. What would the implications be? of finding life elsewhere. Is it something anti-biblical? Not really. At the time of the Bible being written, people accepted a universe that were, you know, full of all the monsters of the Iliad and the Odyssey. Even in our tradition, we have angels created by God. We're used to the idea that there could be other creatures in a loving relationship to God the same way that we are. What we can't do, I think, is impose our own preconceptions on what that life is gonna be. We have to be open to wherever the science takes us. We can't assume that intelligent creatures are going to give us the salvation that we're so desperately looking for, the answer to how to live a good life. You know what? We already had a savior come to earth and not a whole lot of people have listened to him either. Ethics, love, truth, beauty, these are not things that accumulate the way that technology accumulates. Knowing how to live a good life, knowing how to live a holy life, doesn't depend on technology. There were saints walking the earth before we had iPhones. What we can say is that our new technologies will allow us to communicate better with each other and learn faster and maybe more efficiently. Our new technologies will allow us to encounter other races and other ideas, and we will certainly learn. We will have that marvelous experience of seeing their experience of God as we share with them our experience of God.